Uh, welcome to uh, Speak Up Newport. My name's Ed Selich. I'm president of Speak Up Newport. Uh, Speak Up Newport is uh, Newport Beach's forum for discussion of community issues. Uh, we put on 10 programs a year. Uh, we sponsor the annual mayor's dinner, and we reward scholarships to, uh, for college scholarships to Newport Harbor and Corona Del Mar High School students. Now today is the 18th anniversary of 9-11, and so before we give our program tonight, I'm going to ask you to observe a moment of silence in memory of those civilians and first responders who lost their lives in that tragic event of almost two decades ago. Thank you. Uh, we have a couple of VIPs here this evening. First of all, I'd like to introduce our mayor, Diane Dixon. Diane. And then also we have Councilman Jeff Herdman. Jeff. And as always, we've got a great uh, um, spread out there by the bungalow, so let's give them a hand and thank you for all the food. Now the um, format for the program tonight is each speaker is going to present for around 10 minutes or so. Then we'll open it up for questions. I'm gonna field the questions. And when the questions come around, please ask a concise question. I like to minimize the speeches and statements. It gives other people a time to ask their questions. And also name who it's directed to. And uh, after the, the uh, presentations, we should have time for about 30 minutes or so of um, questioning. And our subject this evening is uh, dogs and our beaches and in our parks. And our speakers in the following order are Sean Levin. He's our city's recreation and senior services uh, department's direct deputy director. And he's going to focus on where dogs are permitted and the pertinent regulations. And also he's gonna show us the uh, preliminary plans for the Sunset View Dog Park. Next to Sean, we have Nick Ott. He's our, one of our city uh, animal control officers and he'll be focusing on the enforcement practices of dogs on the parks and in the beaches, and including the unofficial dog beach at the Santa Ana River. And then finally, we have uh, Gary Brown. He's the uh, founder and president of Orange County Coast Keepers, and uh, he'll present Coast Keepers' perspective on dogs on the beach. I was with Gary last December at the Coastal Commission meeting here in Newport Beach, and he ended indicated to me at the time that he had some thoughts on dog beaches and at the Santa Ana River. And so he's gonna focus on that and uh, Coast Sweeper's position. So with that, uh, Sean, it's up to you. Hello, there we go. Uh, good evening, thank you for all coming out tonight. My name's Sean Levin. I'm here on behalf of the Recreation and Senior Services Department and we're in charge of the use of parks and facilities and what goes on on the beach. So I'm gonna talk about the rules. Um, if anybody's interested at the end, I've got the whole municipal code just on dogs. There's about three pages of rules. I'm gonna go over the high spots on uh, what those are uh, as we go through. So uh, where, where can we bring our dogs in Newport Beach? That's kind of where we're gonna start out here. Do we need leashes on our dogs in Newport Beach? Yes, we do. Um, this is sort of the legalese here, if you want to read through all that, but in, in plain English, we need do dogs on leashes no longer than six feet everywhere in the city unless it's on your private property. Uh, there is one, uh, one exception to that. If you get the owner or leasee to give you written permission on somebody else's property, then you're allowed to have it that way. So um, the good rule of thumb is to have your dog on a leash. Okay, specific rules for dogs. There's some specific rules for dogs that pertain to beaches and bays. Uh, the first one is uh, dogs are not permitted on oceanfront beach or oceanfront sidewalks between the hours of 10 a.m. and 4.30 p.m. year round. Uh, dogs are not permitted on any harbor or bayfront beach between the hours of 9 a.m. and 5 p.m. year round. Uh, and the other one that's included in there is you're supposed to have an implement or a device to pick up after your dog. Um, I don't know if anybody's noticed, but not everybody picks up after their dog uh, here or in any other city. So I don't know if you've seen our fantastic signs, but the Poop Fairy 
has graced the city of Newport Beach. I think, Jeff, was this your idea? This was Jeff's idea. At first, I thought this was, I'm like, are you serious, the poop fairy? But people love the poop fairy. They ask us for the signs all the time. So it's just kind of a fun way to uh, educate people, uh, educate your neighbors, that it's important to pick up after your animal if you have an animal. So... And then there's, there's some places where dogs are, are just prohibited, period. Um, and those are on public piers and docks, uh, Balboa Island Park, and uh, the playground and grass court and area at 38th Street Park. And if you ask me why, I don't know why. Way back in time, at some point, um, these rules were brought to a city council who voted them into the municipal code for some reason. But it was way back, uh, way back when. So, but these are the rules uh, on where dogs are prohibited. So where can you take your dog off a leash? We have a beautiful dog park right behind you, right up the hill. Um, and it's open from 7 a.m. to dusk. And it's very clean and very well maintained. Um, if you go up there, uh, I have, there's one time I've been up there that I've smelled urine out of all the times I go up there. It's, it's cleaned every Wednesday morning, uh, so it's a great place to bring your dog off leash. And one of the other things um, that we've heard over the years, especially since this tar dog park has been built, is we want more dog parks in the city. So back in 2014, the city council at the time directed uh, to our P Parks, Beaches, and Recreation Commission uh, to take a look at where they might look to put a dog park in the city of Newport Beach. Um, and actually, Commissioner Hayes is here. He was on that subcommittee uh, that did that. So the result of that, that, that ad hoc committee was coming up uh, with, there was four locations. The number one priority was far, far above the rest was uh, Lower Sunset View Park. And it came up for a, a variety of reasons. One was it was on the west side of town. Um, because this dog park was on the east side of town. And also, most of the people who live on the peninsula and in that area don't have big yards or yards at all. So that was another reason that was uh, one, of the, one of the considerations. Uh, the property is already owned by the city. Uh, there's adequate parking. Uh, it's not adjacent to, directly adjacent to homes, and it has spectacular views. So um, looks like we're going to have some questions later about that. We'll talk about those. Um, so that, those were the recommendations. And uh, since that time, uh, there's been a con two concepts have kind of come together. Um, this is probably a whole nother speak up Newport if we wanted to get into it, but Sunset Ridge Park was built without a parking lot. Uh, so that's always been an issue since we've had the park is how to connect the parking to the park. So We've always talked about building a bridge. And so this is a concept for the bridge. The city has received a grant from Caltrans, which would help fund that. So this came to the Parks, Beaches, and Recreation Commission uh, two months ago. And it's going to city council in October uh, to review the concept. So the concept is this bridge going from the existing parking lot, which would be expanded, and uh, also including a dog park, which is up there on the uh, north end of the property. So this is just to kind of give you an idea of the size of the dog park. Our, this is our current dog park on um, your left, um, which is 0.44 acres. And the proposed dog park is 0.18 acres, which is significantly smaller. But um, what I will say is if you, if you ever go up to our dog park up top, the dogs are always congregated in the two um, synthetic turf areas on, on, on either end. They don't really like the dirt, so um, it just kind of gives you a perspective that it could fit there because that's where the dogs, most of the use is and where people congregate. So at this point, I'm going to turn it on over to Nick. Thank you.
Hi, my name is Nick Ott. I am one of the city's five animal control officers. Um, in the city of Newport Beach, animal controls run out of the police department. We have five animal control officers that work for the police department in Newport Beach. Um, I'm one of them. I've worked for the police department for 11 years now. Um, I've been doing animal control for about five and a half of those 11 years. Um, and I'm here to talk to you about our enforcement practices for the dog regulations that Mr. Levin just spoke about. So. Part of our duties is we patrol all the parks and beaches in the city um, and we ensure compliance with the regulations that Mr. Levin spoke about and this, I'm just here to give you some information about our enforcement and the education that goes along with that. So the first question is why do we have animal regulations? Mr. Levin talked about how you know dogs are required to be on a leash, there are certain areas where they can and can't be. Um, so I pulled some statistics from 2018 and in 2018 our police department's dispatch took 458 calls from members of the public complaining about dogs off leash somewhere in the city, in a park, on the streets, on the beaches. We took 458 calls um, about that. So it is a community concern um, and it is something that our residents are calling us about when they see it. Um, we had 174 calls for service for animal bites in 2018. Um, and obviously one of the best ways to prevent animal bites from occurring out in public spaces is to have the dogs on a leash. Um, as a result of those uh, incidents in 2018, our animal control officers at the police department issued 409 warnings and 115 citations for violation of dog related regulations. So either leash laws, dogs on the beach, um, not picking up after your dog, those sorts of things. Um, that's, you know, 500 and some odd people who our officers spoke to in the field and either provided some education in the form of a warning or a citation if, the, if that was appropriate in the circumstances. In 2018, we conducted 1,366 proactive patrol checks. So that's not responding to one of those calls for service. That's us going out and checking a park or driving on the beach and looking for violations on the beach and being out there to you know, educate people and if people have questions and approach us and that sort of thing. Um, in the same year, we initiated 129 rabies control investigation reports, so what most people would call animal bite reports, um, on behalf of Orange County Public Health. One of our roles in animal control, um, we're deputized by the Public Health Department in Orange County to act in their stead and investigate animal bites and ensure um, that the victim who was bitten by a dog isn't going to get rabies from the dog that bit them. And so we do things like verifying vaccination, verifying that the dogs remain healthy for 10 days following the incident, and there, there's a whole process that we go through. So in 2018, we did 129 of those, and 19 of those incidents were further investigated as either potentially dangerous or vicious dog cases. And those are cases where we think um, that the dog may be a danger to public safety and we need to go a little bit further than just doing the, the bite report aspect. Additionally, in 2018, our city's park patrol officers contacted 879 people for dog-related dog violations in city parks. So park patrol in Newport Beach doesn't work for the police department. They work for the recreation department, uh, Mr. Levin's uh, department. And the park patrol officers are a great resource for us out there because um, we have a lot of calls for service demands. We respond to injured animals. We respond to barking dog complaints. We respond to animal cruelty cases. So a lot of times we aren't able to be as proactive as we'd like to be. Um, so, you know, our 500 and some odd contacts uh, were added to by our city's park patrol officers who conducted 879 contacts educating people or taking enforcement action when necessary. So what do we do to educate people? Every park beach in the city has some sort of sign that tells people what the rules are. And these are kind of our traditional regulatory signs. So the one that you see here on the left, the yellow one, um, that's mainly used in parks. And then the white and red one on the right is mainly used in beaches. Um, basically the one on the left is letting folks know that their dogs have to be on a leash and that they have to uh, pick up after them and carry something to do that with. The one on the right tells people that their dogs can't be on the beach between whether it's 10 or, and 4.30 or 9 and 5, depending on whether it's an ocean or a bay beach, lets people know that they have to pick up after their animals and that they have to be leashed at all times. That sign is posted at every entrance to the beach, at every street end. Um, so anyone who walks out onto the beach with a dog has to pass that sign in order to go past it. Um, what we found is that a lot of folks miss the signs. They don't necessarily read them, especially the beach one. There's a lot of words on there and a lot of things and people don't necessarily read the whole thing. Um, and so in certain parts of the city where we had extra concerns about animals off leash, um, the city has put in some additional educational signage to kind of try to make the point a little bit more clear or explain to people why it's important. 
Um, so for example, in one part of our city down by the wedge, um, we have a protected endangered species that likes to hang out down there called the snowy plover. Some of you guys may be familiar with them. Um, and because the snowy plovers inhabit that area, it's particularly important that dogs down there be kept on a leash and that people follow the rules. So they put in some extra signs with pictures of the birds and explaining to people why it's important to keep them on a leash. Um, and at our west city limits, um, where we border up against a county area, and I'll go on to talk about that, um, we put in some additional signage, a reminder about dogs, and it kind of spells it out a little bit more clearly to people than the standard beach sign does about the dogs have to be on a leash, they can't be on the beach between 10 and 4.30, things of that nature. So I was asked to speak about um, the issue with regards to the Santa Ana River mouth, and what is the city's position and enforcement action down there, and what do, we, what do we as the city of Newport Beach do when we're down there? So first and foremost, I wanted to show you uh, what the actual boundary line is. So that dashed blue line is the western border of the city of Newport Beach. So when you go down there, if you're familiar with the area, most people go to the end of seashore, they walk on at Summit Street, and they cross Newport Beach for a short distance before they reach the county area. Anything that occurs on the west side of that line or to the left of that blue line, that's not in our city's jurisdiction. That's unincorporated Orange County, that's the Sheriff's Department or County Animal Control's jurisdiction. Everything on the right side of the line is the city of Newport Beach. We enforce our regulations there just as we would enforce our regulations anywhere else. So when they're on the beach in Newport, the dog cannot be on the beach between 10 and 4.30 um, and it has to be on a leash at all times. That's what we enforce when we're down there on our side of the line. As far as the other side of the line, again, that's not, that's not our jurisdiction. We don't do the enforcement, um, but just so that you guys are aware when the Sheriff's Department is down there and what their enforcement is, under the Orange County Codified Ordinance, it's actually unlawful for anyone to be on the left side of that line, whether they have a dog or not. That is considered part of the Santa Ana River, which is a flood control channel, and the county has an ordinance that says that no person at any time can be in a flood control channel. So because that is considered part of a flood control channel, the county ordinance prohibits trespassing in that area, and those are the regulations that the Sheriff's Department enforces. So again, um, it's a little bit of a tricky situation. We get calls you know, down there saying, you know, there's 100 dogs off leash, and when we get down there, you know, there may be one or two on the Newport side, most of them are on the county side. So we do enforce our regulations when we're down there. That means people coming to and from the county area need to have their dog on a leash and can't have it on our beach between 10 and 4.30. Um, but we only take enforcement action for violations on basically on the right side of that line. And I wanted to give some statistics on our enforcement specifically in that area. So these numbers up there are that part of our, our jurisdictional area down in the, in the vicinity of the Santa Ana River bed. So in 2018, we conducted 227 proactive patrol checks of that area. During those proactive patrol checks, we issued 133 written warnings and 54 citations for violations occurring in our jurisdiction in that area. Um, that represents, just to kind of give you a picture of, of you know, the, the resources that the city patrols that area with, that was 16% of, of all of our patrol checks. So all the patrol checks we did in the whole city, 16% of them were in that area. 32.5% of the written warnings that we issued were in that area. That's, that's compared to the whole city. And almost half of the citations that we issued um, citywide, 46.9% were issued in that area. Um, and that's a, that's a direct result of resident complaints. Um, residents have expressed their concern both to the police department and to their representatives at City Hall um, that they're uh, dissatisfied with animal violations that are occurring on the Newport side of the border. So we do focus on that area when we have the opportunity. And when we're in the area, we take enforcement action when it's appropriate. So far this year, we've conducted 162 patrol checks. We've, we've issued exactly 100 written warnings so far this year um, and 29 citations. So obviously that number is going to be a little bit less because we're not done with 2019 yet, but we are pretty much through summer. Um, and I will tell you that summer generates the most action for us down there. So um, I wouldn't expect those numbers to get too much higher by the end of the year. They'll, they'll go up a little bit. Obviously, we'll keep you know, patrolling as we do, but it, they're not going to get a lot higher. So what you're seeing is a reduction in that, and I can speak just uh, you know, from having been down there and you know, a, little bit, uh, a little bit from that experience, um, it, we are seeing more compliance on the Newport side. Um, we, did a lot of, we did a lot of proactive enforcement, we did a lot of education, the city put up some additional signage to help educate people, um, and we are seeing fewer violations when we're down there, um, at least on our side of the border, and that's reflected in the numbers, I think. Um, so I'm just gonna use this opportunity to talk um, 
a little bit and then transition to uh, the gentleman from the Coast Keepers. Um, one of the reasons that we're concerned about that area is it has been brought to the city's attention um, that there is an environmental aspect um, to the dogs being off leash in that area, whether it's on the county side or the Newport side. Um, there is an area across the bay or across the river on the right, right behind that lifeguard tower up in the corner. That fenced in area um, is nesting habitat for some important uh, species that are threatened or endangered. Um, and by having dogs off leash in that area, um, it does have an impact on that species. And so one of the times we were down there and there were no dogs in the riverbed whatsoever, I took this photo um, showing some of, the, some of the birds actually using the riverbed to forage and things of that nature. So that's the end of my, uh, that's the end of my presentation and I will uh, transfer to Mr. Brown. They say a, a picture is worth a thousand words, so this is the extent of my PowerPoint. <laughs> um, for those of you who don't know who Orange County Coast Keeper is, I started the organization here in Newport 20 years ago. Basically, uh, in 1998, uh, we had 1,365 closed and posted beaches because of pollution in our nearshore waters. And that was for the 42 mile coastline of Orange County. And I kept saying, how come somebody doesn't do something about it? And nobody did. So finally I got so frustrated, I said, okay, I will. And, and so I started the organization. And um, we basically have six pillars of our program. We do a lot of education. Today we're in over 40 high schools. Um, we have a STEM curriculum for watershed. We talk, we show kids where come, water comes from, besides the faucet and where it goes besides the drain. We uh, take them out on field trips. We pay for the buses and we show them the facilities. We teach them how to sample water in a waterway near their school. And so we have a number of programs that are education. We do advocacy at all levels of government. Um, and up to and including, we actually go in and write the permits that cities have to comply with. We work with uh, uh, regulators uh, to write permits to kind of raise the bar so we have cleaner water. Um, we do a lot of restoration, particularly here. For 11 years, we grew kelp in laboratories, and we had 70 volunteer divers. We took it out and planted it on reefs, and that's why Laguna Beach, for the first time in 40 years, had kelp canopies. And, we, we started from the South Jetty in Newport to Dana Point. Um, nobody loses sleep over kelp, but in Newport and other places, they did ask, we used to have great fishing here. What happened to the fish? Because kelp is the habitat to over 800 species of fish. And so, um, and it was amazing. As our kelp grew, the fish came back. It's amazing how resilient the ocean can be. Um, we've been for a number of years, we partnered with the city, the county fish and game some years ago, and we um, uh, tried to plant six sites of eelgrass in Newport. And I got to tell you, it was a miserable failure. Not one blade of eelgrass survived us. And so we thought, well, maybe we should learn how to grow it here first. And so we spent several years using every known method on how to grow eelgrass. Finally, we found what works here in Newport. Uh, we uh, planted more eelgrass last year than, than uh, we did in the preceding four years. And now we're restoring Olympia oysters, which is indigenous to this harbor. And, and we're actually, one of the very important things, and we have three universities that are working with us, and a team from UC Davis comes down every month. And, and we're, uh, I never thought when I started Coast Keeper, I'd buy 30 tons of, Olymp of Pacific oyster shells. But we bought a mountain of Pacific oyster shells, made bags to put them in, laid them out below the bluffs at, at uh, upper castaways. And we have six sites uh, of, of, Olympia, of, of substrate that Olympia oysters are growing on, and we have it adjacent to eelgrass. And the science project is to see if eelgrass adjacent right next to the, these beds of oysters, if that will um, mitigate for erosion and sea level rise. And, you know, we're looking for natural ways to, to handle the future rather than build the wall higher. And so that we're doing a lot of science on that. And three, like I said, three universities are involved. We do a lot of research, a lot of water monitoring, and 
one thing that you'll hear a little bit about is enforcement. Um, we enforce clean water laws. Uh, we have a staff of attorneys, and we uh, uh, basically identify industries that are polluting. We go to them, show them how they're polluting, show them how they could fix it, and we ask them to voluntarily do that. And um, most of the time they don't volunteer to spend a half a million dollars or more to fix up their facility. So we put them in federal court and we've done over a hundred enforcement cases in federal court. We have a hundred percent success record. And, and so um, with all of our federal cases, um, each, each case goes to the Department of Justice for review and to make sure that nobody's self-dealing, it, it's, it's all um, for the right reasons and, and stuff. And so they also want to see what, in the private world, if you file a lawsuit, and the loser gets a penalty. In, in our environmental world, we call it a supplemental environmental project. And so we have, have directed over $4 million to other projects and NGOs who are doing good things on the ground um, in the region. And I should say, when I say region, um, we have Orange County Coast Keeper. Then in 2005, I couldn't export Orange County to the Inland Empire, so I started another organization called the Inland Empire Water Keeper. And this year, we started the Coachella Valley Water Keeper. So we have offices in, in Palm Desert and Riverside in here. And so we... Uh, uh, we direct these monies, and we've given monies to a number of different projects. One of them was the Huntington Beach of Wetlands Rescue Center in front of the power plant. And we went and we looked and we talked to them and we said, what, what, could you re what would be the best use if we got you some funding? And they said, the snowy plover. They said, they, they taught us a lot about them. Um, they said, we just have kind of Mickey Mouse, whatever we could buy it, they find it the goodwill as a way to birth them. Because what happens is when they nest, the snowy plover nests in the dunes, and they nest in the sand, and usually in, in, they have three eggs. Um, if something happens to where the mother is scared off, she abandons the nest, and the rangers um, in Bolsa Chica and other places try to keep track of where nests are, and they frequently check them when they know that there's eggs because if the mother abandons a nest, they go get them and they take them to the Huntington Beach Wetlands and Rescue Center. And they said, we don't really have the appropriate equipment to, to help them and to, to actually get them to hatch. So we um, directed $35,000 to go to them. And for that money, they bought two incubators, one that they gave high heat and, and humidity, and then when the eggs get closer to hatching, um, the, the other incubator has higher heat, more humidity, and where you play, the rollers turn, so the eggs turn slowly. Then they bought equipment to, to uh, after the eggs are hatched, to put them in where they hatch, and then we built an aviary outside um, to where they could grow in, until they were ready to go out in the wild. So anyhow, that whole experience brought us kind of close to understanding and learning more about the plover. And the problem is it's a threatened species and the California coast has is, is been declared a critical habitat. And so, you know, I think it's the responsibility of all reasonable people to try to um, protect those rare habitats and the, the ones that are threatened and, and before they're totally endangered. And so, you know, that's been our goal. Then I hear a lot of what's going on with the dogs at, at, at the mouth, and, and certainly I was aware of it before. Um, I suppose what, what we look at is, it's kind of fashionable now to be polarized on about everything, um, but wouldn't it be nice if reasonable people could sit down in a room and come up with reasonable solutions? And, you know, when I addressed the Coastal Commission, I said, you know, you, from a legal standpoint, you really don't have a choice that you should protect this ESHA out here with, with the plovers. Um, but you can decide to what degree you do that. We would like to see 
the city of, of Newport enforce its ordinances. Would like to see the county enforce its ordinances. You know, I, I went around on the Santa Ana River myself. There's a, most people don't know it, but upper in Santa Ana Canyon, there's a two and a half mile stretch of the Santa Ana River that's perfect for kayaking. And I, went, I spent a year getting the first permit the county ever issued to kayak the Santa Ana River. But because of the bird habitats, they gave me, it took me two years to get the permit and I got it for six weeks. And if anybody went on the river, they had to sign a declaration saying they realized they could die by doing that. And so I know what it's like to want something, but when the county won't let you, and when the flood control even thinks it's a worse idea, and, and there's some things that you want to do because you think you should be able to, but you know, flat out in today's world, you can't do all of that. And so, you know, it, get over it. It is, <laughs> is, is, is it, that's kind of where we're coming from. Now, I go back to the reasonable people. It isn't, you know, there are places, and, and in the letter of coalition, in a, a coalition of, of, of organizations did that was requesting and has been requesting for more enforcement. Um, you know, th there are some suggestions and I'm sure as many reasons for, there will be reasons con, but people have suggested Big Corona as, I mean, you, you, it has parking, it has infrastructure. Um, next to the Newport Pier, uh, near the Newport Pier, it has more infrastructure. It has restrooms. It has parking. Um, you know, and and the one thing would to keep in mind, and we fought a battle years ago in the Bolsa Chica, is is the developer wanted to build right up to the trees where the raptors were, and he couldn't understand why they couldn't. But when you look at a nest or a habitat, you've got to look at a greater area because those birds have to range and they have to forage for food. And so it's, it's where do they range, where do they forage? It's not just where is the nest located. And like the least turns in the fence on the Huntington Beach side, you know, they, they, forage, they fish in the water, they fish in the Santa Ana River. And, um, they're afraid of dogs. If you have dogs there, you won't have the birds there. And, and it's, it's pretty simple as, as that. Um, uh, I've had a lot of people tell me that the dogs can be there and half hour after dogs go, the birds are back. And, and so, huh? Dogs, more. That's what I'm... Pardon? I... I... Scott, Scott Thomas came and, and he, he's with C and Sage Audubon and he knows more about them than I do. And maybe in the question answer period, he, he would be happy to uh, have dialogue with you and answer the questions. Um, but our, our point is, you know, I think there's solutions. I, I think reasonable people should sit down if, if the, the dog park in Huntington Beach works well. It's obvious that there's a need here, and, and people want a beach uh, dog park. You know, I, I think it, it's also important to note that many of the people who use that aren't, they don't live in Newport. They, I've had people tell me they, they drive from inland cities to come out here and stuff. And so they like the camaraderie, they like a lot of it, but that could be at most places. And so I, I realized that, um, some people would prefer having their dogs play in a calm Santa Ana River versus the ocean. I get that. But, you know, we can't have it all. And, and so, you know, I guess that's my position. We want the Esha to be protected. Um, and, and we think it's all of our responsibility to do that. And so, you know, I, but yet I should say, and I didn't say up front, our staff, I'm a dog lover. I mean, I've had dogs all my life. And our office has a dog policy. Uh, Bruce, a, a border collie, comes to work every day with one of our attorneys, has for a year and a half. Last week, I walked in the office, and there were four of our employees had their dogs there. And so, you know, we all, and, and for the dogs, it's great. Every day's trick or treat, because every desk in the office has dog treats. And they just do the rounds. And, and so it's a happy place, and dogs make it that way. So, you know, this isn't about dogs versus birds. 
I think we can walk and chew gum at the same time. Why can't we do both? And wouldn't it be nice to have a legal dog park where the dogs would enjoy it and the humans would behave? So that's my... Here, you can have that. <laughs> they opened it up here already. All right, so we're going to uh, open it up to uh, questions. We've got two gentlemen in uniforms that... Uh, coincidentally, that have microphones. So when you ask your question, uh, please speak directly into the microphone. And so we'll open it up for questions. I first want to get rid of one real quick tangent. Um, the dog poop bags, are they plastics or biodegradable? Second, um, talking about signs, this is the main thing I want to say, that the signs you show, please, we don't want microplastics, we don't want to breathe them, we don't want to eat them. Biodegradable, please. So um, the signs showed in your PowerPoint, was just a reminder that uh, we really need to improve the signs to make an impression, to get a conversation started. So yesterday, I chastised the city council members, and today I must give you some credit. The sign Jeff made, city of um, San Clemente emailed me, said, have you ever seen this sign? So that gets people's attention, gets the conversation going, right? Um, I mean, generally, talking about the straw, why, why it could succeed, I mean, it's so cool to have a drink with a straw, right? And until people saw the turtle video, and that just changed your whole idea about it. So we should strive for creativity with our science. But thank you. All right, great question. Here's a question right here, Jeff. Yes. Kind of hoping there would be an environmental person there. So here's my, my deal with the dog beach. You, you can't tell me that the birds are not afraid of humans. So if they're going to shut it down, they should shut it down for everybody. Do you not agree with that? And, yeah, I mean, I see, not everyone that goes down there has dogs. There's the people that go down there, and there's kids. They're running around. They're throwing sand. I, I can't imagine those birds are going to be around when that's happening. If they're actually nesting right there, can we build a fence around like they do just down the way so people stay out of that area? Because they're not nesting at the water's edge, no. right? The tide changes every six hours, right? That, that can't be it. So they have the whole area behind the, the overpass that they could go all the way up there. We have the new Belsa Chica wetlands. I don't understand the dogs are the problem here. It's not the dogs. It's the people, number one. But the birds aren't going to be there when people are there either. So if, if they're going to shut it off, they need to shut it off for everybody. That's, that's the way. I hope they don't do that. And I think there's plenty of other spaces other than that one tiny little strip you're talking about. There's all these other places for these birds to go. I mean, I'm an environment. I, I want these birds to survive too, believe me. But I think it's not about the dogs. I think it's about the people who don't want those people coming down there. And it's, a lot of it is these people, and you can't blame the dogs. It's the people. And I see diapers. I see all kinds of crap and, and, and trash. Those aren't the dog people. Those are the other people. So if you want to get rid of all the Inland Empires that are coming down, it just sounds like everyone's clapping. Getting, this is our beach, Newport Beach, only Newport Beach people. Fix that problem. Don't blame the dogs. Okay, question over here. I might just respond to that. There's a couple of questions. My name's Scott Thomas. I'm with Audubon Society. So, uh, people and dogs in any activity are a disturbance down there. But Gary was talking about reasonable solutions. And the solution going way back when we first started dealing with two endangered species down there was unwritten, but it was spoken quite a bit that we were going to try and get some property for the birds on Huntington Beach side where the least turn colony is, fence that off because they had to be protected. They nest colonially and dogs and people were running over the nests. Um, we recognized that dogs were a problem back then. But we made deals that we would have certain arrangements and we weren't going to limit people going to the beach. That meant that there's going to be some disturbance. But that's the reasonable solution kind of thing Gary was talking about, that we were going to limit, protect certain areas and by the 1980s, we helped push getting a law that you couldn't have dogs down on the beach anywhere in the county. That was partially for that river right there. And the answer to whether they're, which is more of a disturbance, exponentially, dogs are much more of a disturbance to birds. 
People on the sand certainly chase birds away. Dogs on the sand chase the birds out of the river water. You can even see the disturbance in the colony inside the fenced area when dogs bark really loud. They are both problems, certainly. A car would be a problem, playing baseball, surfing, anything. People down there is more than if nobody was there. But dogs are exponentially more disruptive to birds, and it's just a fact you can't get away from it. Um, and that's why we may not be the answer that everybody wants, but that is what. All right. Right here. So uh, can we put that uh, drawing back up, the picture that shows the river jetty? And might we have a solution that um, we work towards a fence on the Huntington Beach side that it, as long as I've ever been going down there, I don't really see dogs going up towards the fenced area. So I get your point, Gary, you know, common sense here, trying to meet in the middle here. Uh, there was another one that was not your picture, Nick. I think it might have been in yours, Sean, in your presentation. It was a uh, boundary, line. boundary line, yeah. Your other one, I'll get better. So I think Gary's point is, uh, no, it was uh, the other one. Uh, wasn't there another picture that showed the other side of Huntington Beach? I don't think so. Okay, so uh, maybe it was Nick's then. Anyways, you can see uh, where the picture ends. We're basically trying to keep dogs and or people away, as far enough away as possible from where you guys have those fences right now. So let's maybe consider a fence there that if a dog did get loose from the Newport Beach side across low tide and started to go up. Nick, do you see dogs going up there much? Well, just to put everything into perspective, what you're talking about is on the county side of the border, um, and the city doesn't have any control over what the county chooses to do on that side. That's, that is an issue for the county. Um, anecdotally, to answer your question from being down there, I do see dogs on both sides of the river, but the majority of them are on the Newport Beach side. Um, right. To, to the question earlier about people or dogs, I'm, I'm glad that this is back up. The, the regulation that the Sheriff's Department has been enforcing um, is that dogs and people are prohibited from entering the riverbed. That is the county ordinance. Yeah. Um, obviously, the majority of the people they contact down there are down there with dogs, but when they do see fishermen or people taking off in ultralight uh, type aircrafts and things like that, um, all of that is prohibited, and that is what the Sheriff's Department has been enforcing. Well, so the other part of this is that it is the county area that we're talking about. We have uh, you know, uh, restrictions based in Newport Beach, so we're really talking about the county of Orange. So this really is a Board of Supervisors issue. In regards to protecting what you're trying to do, Gary, um, with the Orange County Board of Supervisors and with maybe your blessing as a common sense thing to be able to have some type of fence that then gives a boundary so that no people and or animals could make it up close to your current fence. And then in regards to it being a county asset, I mean, it has been the default dog beach for a long time. And there are a lot of people within the county, Orange County, that do like to come down and use that area uh, for spending time with their dogs. Now, as far as the people that might be complaining here uh, in Newport Beach, it's kind of like, uh, you know, you bought property right next to a uh, Little League field and you're maybe upset that people are playing baseball. Uh, you knew that this was a default dog beach. So... I think as far as everybody keeping it cool down there and keeping it clean and hospitable, there's got to be some, using your verbiage, Gary, some common sense here, um, that we don't just turn things off uh, completely for any one party. So I think maybe a fence is something that could help out there. But let's keep the conversation going. I think that's important to keep the conversation going. And, and you know, I think it would be great if we could, as citizens of this area to, to basically come up with solutions and, and find solutions. Um, but it, it's going to take leadership from somewhere. Yeah. And there really has been a void at the local level, and there's certainly a void at the Board of Supervisors. And, and 
the, the county staff is doing what they can do when they can do it. And, and I, I get all that, but you know, I, I, I think that sitting down at the table and coming up with reasonable solutions and having a respectful dialogue with each other needs leadership to put it together and start the process. Well, this is a good start, right, for everybody to get together. So very appreciative of you guys hosting this for sure. Um, would you then point blank be okay, Gary, with that type of a plan with the fence? Oh, I, I don't know enough right now to say yes or no, and, and certainly it's the county's property. Yeah. And, yeah. and I wouldn't say yes or no without talking to biologists. Yeah. yeah. Are smarter on that than I am. And, and so, but, but you're right, it's a place to start. Other than the polarization that's going on, let's start. Yeah, we definitely need to get to a point, though, because, Nick, you don't want to be down there, you know, uh, giving people tickets, right? Um, that's really not what you guys want to be doing. Um, the neighbors don't want to have the hassle down there, um, per se. And uh, as far as a county asset, a lot of people within Orange County want to use that particular area for, for a dog beach. So, yeah, yeah keep the let's, conversation let's going. Thank you. Chance here. Lady in the red back there. Well, one of the things that, uh, I am a biologist actually, and one of the things that you have to understand about the river habitat is that those birds need that habitat to forage. That little tiny least turn and those little small snowy plovers would have to travel much, much farther to forage. And especially at a critical size when their chicks are just hatching out, they actually give their um, chicks individual fish it's not regurgitation. So they have to go forage for a fish and bring it to a chick, forage for a fish and bring it to a chick. And if those dogs are in that river, they can't use that river. They've closed off that entire habitat area to foraging birds. So it's much more complex than your simplification of putting up a fence. It's much more than that. Okay, Laura? I live in Corona Del Mar, so uh, first, someone said Big Corona and Dog Beach, and that just makes me kind of cringe, but we've got aside, because I think we all live the city. I want to ask about, I want to ask about the Snowy Plover plan for the wedge, because I've been to two meetings at Marina Park where there was a Snowy Plover plan presented and folks were here. There was progress from the first plan to the second plan in terms of the second version being more specific, but still a lot of vagueness about w the policy on dogs and the most recent rendition said we'll let dogs be there when they're permitted during the current plan and as we've heard that really contributes to lower birth weight to fewer chicks in a nest and things like that so where are we at on the snowy plover plan in the west in the Newport Beach side and in, in general what are the milestones that are coming up thank you sure I can answer that it's been the plans been submitted to the Coastal Commission so we're just waiting to hear back if they're gonna come back and want more comments or if they're gonna put us on the agenda sometime in the future. So it's been submitted, uh, the second edition of it, and so the next step will be at the Coastal Commission. So what's the, like my question as well though was, thank you, what is the um, component related to dogs? Because the second plan still said, we'll allow dogs, people to have their dogs on leash in the areas during nesting season. And it really didn't make a lot, it's, we'll do education, but it really didn't take into account the critical habitat impact um, on nesting birds from dogs mm -hmm. in that period. Right, so it, that's, that's, how it's, that's how it is in the plan, that they'll be allowed on the beach during the hours that they're allowed on leash. All right, question right here. Yes, the, uh, the preserve there that's got the double and fenced enclosure. Uh, I'm sure everybody's heard of the term claim jumping, where you say, oh, just a little bit more, just a little bit more. We've got two fences in there for a preserve. Are we saying that's not enough? We had a kind of a convergence of two trajectories at the same time. <laughs> As Dog Beach grew and went from a unofficial, I try not to even use that term, but went from an unofficial, local, used, small kind of area where people were using dogs, it became advertised and it went ballistic and it got big and people were bringing groups of dogs and it was on the internet and you could find anywhere in the country Dog Beach. So we, the numbers went up greatly 
At the same time, we were going through a process with the California Lease Turn and the Western Snowy Plover, trying to understand why we'd worked so hard to get them off the endangered species list. Their numbers had come up and then they leveled off. They didn't go continue up. We found about seven or eight factors that were contributing to that. Um, fish problems, um, predation problems. But one of them, about the same time we were starting to hear about Dog Beach, was disturbances outside the colonies, um, primarily from pets. Up north, it's, sometimes it's horses. But dogs, um, other disturbances too. Motorized vehicles in Pismo Beach. Um, so the area that we set aside inside that fence was because the main obvious problem that people recognized in the 1960s was that the birds couldn't nest on the beach without getting run over. And the immediate stopgap solution was to put a fence. In Huntington Beach, not all the colonies have a fence. Some of them are marked off in other ways. But in Huntington Beach, the, the solution was to put a fence. The fence has gotten slightly bigger over the years. But put in perspective, they used to nest for half a mile away from the river and up next to the river. We now have what is a, essentially, if you look at it on a map, it's a really small little area. It looks big when you're there, but compared to what's all in Huntington Beach and Newport Beach, it's a small area. So the answer is, yeah, it is kind of a stepped out thing. It wasn't done with any intent other than we were looking at why won't the bird continue its trajectory up in the population numbers and disturbance is one of the issues. Okay, any other questions? Seymour. No, see more. Well, I want to talk about an area of town that's a long way from the Santa Ana River jetty. <clears throat> We've been talking about snowy plovers and the dogs on the beach up there. I live on Balboa Island, and uh, I think that might be dog central. There are dogs constantly parading around Balboa Island. And uh, I just wonder sometimes where the enforcement is. I never see any enforcement going on. There are dogs on the beach at the wrong hours constantly. There are dogs running around with no leashes. Uh, the six-foot leash is a joke. Hardly anybody uses a six-foot leash. And I saw a statistic here tonight that maybe helps me to understand this situation. 115 citations for the year. I, I don't think people become believers until they're afraid of being cited. And the, the dog owners and the people that bring their dogs down to Balboa Island are obviously not afraid of being cited because they violate all the laws all the time, and I've never seen any enforcement. If I could give citations, I could sit in front of my house and give 50 citations a day easily. And I don't know if you guys, I'm not very emotional about this because I'm not even sure these dog laws are a good idea. But if we have them, maybe they should be enforced. Just a novel idea. I, I can speak to that uh, with Babo Island specifically. Um, obviously, I didn't pull numbers for Babo Island because that wasn't an area that we were asked to specifically address. Um, but I can speak anecdotally to Babo Island. Um, we do patrol Babo Island on a regular basis. I would say in the last six months, I would say on average about twice a week, one of our officers will park somewhere on the island and walk the entire loop. They'll walk North Bay front, South Bay front, Little Island, the whole thing. Um, and they do enforcement when they're down there. I'm usually one of them doing it. Um, I just want to ask you, what are they wearing when they do that? Because I never see them. What I'm wearing right now, minus the tie. I don't usually wear the tie down there. Um, yeah, now I, what I can say though is Balboa Island pr does present um, challenges in terms of patrolling it um, because I can pull my truck to the end of any individual street and see three or four streets in either direction, but I can't see the whole island. So the way that we patrol the island generally is we park and we walk the entire loop. Um, and obviously we need staff on duty in order to do that. Like I said, about on average myself over the last six months, I've usually walked the island about twice a week. Um, but, and we try to hit it at random times to answer your question. Honestly, it's whenever I'm available and whenever I have time to do that. And that kind of lends itself to being unpredictable, so we're not always there at the same time. But what I can say is the challenge of, of that island and the way that we have to patrol it um, is unless you're sitting in your front, you know, you're sitting in your front patio right when I walk by, your chance of seeing me there is pretty slim. Because um, I'm probably walking by your house for 10 seconds and I'm continuing on. And I will say on average, again, this is just anecdotal since I didn't pull the numbers, but usually when we do one of those patrols, we usually average about one or two either written warnings or citations each time we go out there. And um, I, you'll, 
for the numbers that you made reference to earlier, 409, I think it was, written warnings and 100 and some odd citations in 2018, um, I think the numbers actually reflect the fact that people um, do respond to the warnings because I can tell you most of our officers, myself included, aren't going to give the same person a warning twice. So the warning, if we're going to issue it, if it's appropriate in the circumstances, it's usually kind of a one-time deal. Um, and if that same person is violating the ordinance again in the future, they're going to receive a citation, generally speaking. Um, and so the fact that you see 400 and some odd warnings versus 100 and some odd citations, to me, does reflect that the majority of people do take the warning seriously and they do, uh, that does change their behavior and I think it's appropriate in those circumstances. Um, but again, we are out on Babo Island. Um, I'd be happy to stop by and say hi the next time I'm out there, but we do, we do walk the island on a regular basis. But like I said, unless you happen to be looking out when I walk by for 10 seconds, you're probably gonna miss me, so. I, I love penguins. So I have been in Patagonia to the state parks there that have penguins. I've been in the Falklands and the Antarctic. One of the solutions that they came up with down there, because if you know anything about penguins, you cannot walk in front of them when they're walking out to sea to get the fish to feed their youngs. So it will de to totally derail them. So what happens is they have state park rangers or volunteers, which might be a solution you know, for, you know, enforcing some of these uh, regulations. Uh, maybe members of the community might be willing to volunteer to help enforce cleaning up the beach, taking care to make sure the people, you know, calling, for, for example, to get an enforcement officer there, or actually getting a state park ranger stationed at that point on the beach. I have a question. I actually have a few questions. How much is the citation for off-leash? So we don't set the fines on the citations. They're, they're set, depending on the type of citation we issue, there are civil citations that are dealt with through the city and there are criminal citations that are dealt with through the court and we issue them appropriately in each circumstance. But what I can say is the minimum fine is $100, the maximum fine is $500, and either the city ordinance or the court sets the fine somewhere in the middle based on the based on the situation. But my, but my important question was Sunset Park, a new topic. Is that already decided and approved? There was a lot of conflict about the Sunset Park also. And that's my first question. You're talking about uh, lower Sunset View, for the dog the park, park and the park? the view yeah. that everybody laughed at having a view for the yeah. dogs. Yeah. Um, it has not been. It's, the process is really just starting. Okay. So there's so. going to be a, there's going to be public process for that. That's still got to go through the whole process. So if you have opinions about that, um, you, there's still time to be involved with that. So the Absolutely. parking lot is there in front, and the dog, based on the diagram you drew, and the dog park, the dog park is adjacent to the parking lot. Is that correct? Correct. The, so the, what's the bridge for? Over the over bridges superior. To connect, the bridges connect the parking with the park, Sunset Ridge Park across the street. Nothing to do with the dog park. No. Thank you. Okay. And, and, right. and one more comment. People enjoy the views, and so it's not the dogs. It's people come to dog parks with their dogs, and it's a public place for us residents to be and enjoy the view also. I agree. I think that was kind of the point, was the dog owners would be seeing the view, but I guess dogs see too. It's black and white, right? <laughs> All right, one more question right here. To follow up on your point, um, a couple things. Number one, I live... Uh, next to the proposed dog park for which the city has uh, made a, a, a statement that there is no adjacent neighborhood, which isn't true. Um, and I just, additionally, I mean, despite probably your uh, very um, laudable efforts, there is widespread non-compliance with the dog walkers in that area as it relates to leash laws, as it relates to not picking up after the droppings, um, so it's a bad situation now that we all anticipate would get substantially worse. And, you know, that is a pristine, serene view that a large number of people regularly enjoy. And to kind of cede it to dogs, I think, is, a, you know, not the highest and best use of that property. I mean, you've got all those people that come with their dogs. Well, they do come with the dogs, but I would propose to you that that's... A minority of people that have dogs there's probably 10 people that would like to enjoy the view without the dogs more than those people that would like to enjoy the view with their own dogs 
And so, I mean, it's my observation into today. I, am, I have uh, sympathy for the snowy clover that is, you know, endangered, an endangered species, but I'd also say that it almost seems like, uh, you know, the city and state taxpayer is an endangered species in terms of, you know, having their interests represented. Yes. So, you know, I, I mean, as a pointed case, the neighborhood that is immediately adjacent to the proposed dog park for 40 years has prohibited dogs, and therefore it seems like a, you know, a particularly inopportune place uh, to have a dog park, but thank you. Okay, well that's all the time we have this evening. Uh, let's thank our speakers for coming out. Uh, just one last note before we adjourn. October the 9th, uh, Harley Ruda, our congressman, is going to be here. He's going to tell us how he's addressing issues of local concern in Washington. And it's going to be an opportunity for you to ask him questions about things you have concerns about. So come on back October 9th, and we'll see you next month. Mm -hmm.